Well, still on the business front of sorts, and Craig Emerson's got his uh, supermarket review out this morning that says that the big supermarket giants should not be broken up. Instead, they should be threatened with a big stick if they break a mandatory code of conduct. So let's get the coalition response to that now. Joining us is the Shadow Finance Minister, Jane Hume. Jane, it's good to see you in person. Good Thanks to for coming too, in Pete. today. So Craig Emerson so far, according to the AFR this morning, he's called the coalition approach to breaking up the supermarket chain as, chains as populist, lacks credibility, it would lead to store closures and job losses. What's your response to that? Well, considering the Coalition hasn't come out with a policy, I think that's a big call from Craig Emerson. Of course, this is an interim report that he has released, and let's be honest, he's released it to the media, not to the Coalition, so we haven't been able to see it yet. We will go through that report very carefully and in great detail. We do know that prices at the supermarket are causing people a lot of pain in their hip pocket. Prices have already gone up by around 10% in the last two years alone. The price of bread has gone up by around 17.5%. The price of milk has gone up by around 16.5%. So we know that Australian consumers are feeling it in their hip pocket. Is this the right response? Well, we'll wait and see to read the report and go through it in great detail. Mm. However, what I would say is you can question the gen the, the, you know, how genuine the, opposite, the, sorry, the government is on this issue if at the same time as they're trying to beat up the supermarkets, they're also levying attacks on farmers through a biosecurity levy, which of course gets immediately passed on through higher prices of groceries. If they're levying attacks on truckies through uh, uh, diesel fuel charges, which also get directly passed on to the price of groceries, and if they're not getting the prices of energy under control and they're inflicting enormous changes to the industrial relations system, which locks up the, these big supermarket companies in a lot of red tape with their employment contracts. All of these things are feeding higher prices. There isn't just one solution. There are plenty of solutions. And quite frankly, I'd question the government's sincerity when they say they want to get supermarket prices down if they're doing all these other things. All right. What's your solution? Well, we will uh, come back to you with... Um, uh, the so moment. you don't have one yet? No, no, that's, not, that's okay. not at all what I say. The first thing we would do is get inflation down, right? Mm. I mean, it, it, quite frankly, the way to get prices down is to get inflation down, get inflation under control. This government has shown no real appetite to get inflation under control because its spending is still out of control. $209 billion just in the last two years alone, additional spending. Of course, this means that inflation stays higher for longer, interest rates stay higher for longer, and people are doing it tough. Surely that has got to be the first thing. In the meantime, though, we will look at super supermarket powers and we will look at whether they are being fair on farmers and price, passing on price reductions to consumers and we'll look at that okay. through a different lens. So Craig Emerson, I mean, this, this is back on, on the idea of, 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 of divesting um, the, the, the supermarket giants. He basically says that if, if the giants are forced to sell, so say you've got a Woolworths and then they've got to sell a Metro, for example. Mm -hmm then his concern is that that metro could just be picked up by another giant. So then it becomes counterproductive and then leads to greater market concentration. Do you share that view at all? Well, there is always concern with divestiture for divestiture powers, whether uh, they will actually decrease prices. In the same right. way, though, you would but also you're looking at that, you would you? also you would also consider that whether enormous fines, the way that uh, Craig Emerson is mm. considering, whether they will have the effect of increasing but aren't you of decreasing at prices. Uh, certainly, we are looking at a way to make sure that supermarkets uh, pass on those lower prices from the farm gate onto consumers, and perhaps that might be part of the mix. But the most important thing here is that we have a competitive supermarket industry that is also being uh, has lower input costs, whether it be through industrial relations, whether it be through energy prices, whether it be through the prices that farmers have to charge for their produce. And quite frankly, if you're not getting those things right, well, of course, the supermarkets have to pass on higher okay. prices. OK. Do you have concerns that, I mean, breaking a mandatory code of conduct, I mean, a $10 million fine or whatever it is for a multi-billion dollar company, that's just pocket change, it, is it not? It's enormous. We, no, it's very... You it's think very, it is? It's absolutely significant. And it will be significant too for shareholders. So, that's, so you support forget, that then? And let's not forget who the shareholders are. The shareholders are superannuation funds and superannuation, superannuation right. members. So you support that, that, that big stick approach then from Craig Emerson with the big fines if they breach a mandatory code of conduct? Well, there's already a um, there's already significant fines available okay. to uh, to those that breach um, competitive comp competition. But that's levels. not mandatory. No, the code of conduct isn't mandatory. The code of conduct is voluntary. And quite frankly, looking at a, a mandatory code of conduct is not necessarily a bad thing. 
I'm sure that's the recommendation of the report. We'll wait till we see the report okay. to see the details as how that will be managed because the ACCC can already do this. And if the ACCC can already do this, what additional powers do you want to give them? OK. Uh, and Angus Taylor, David Littleproud, they're still looking at their review. No change on that front at the moment. It's Still full underway. steam ahead. OK. Just a final one. A third boat arrival uh, since November yes. last year. The government says this is Operation Sovereign Borders working. The new boat load, they're already in Nauru. I mean, isn't that just what you guys would be doing if you were in power? If a boat arrival came, they would be shipped off straight away? Oh, quite frankly, the undermining of Operation so so um, Sovereign Borders over the last two years is what's brought this third boat that has arrived, let's remember, it's arrived undetected, it's dropped off asylum seekers, and then it's returned undetected. This isn't the third boat arrival. There's apparently been around 14 boat arrivals. Just that this is the third that's gone third, no, undetected. No. Mm. That's really concerning. That's very concerning. The fact that the floodgates have been opened, that the people smugglers believe that they can now sell a passage to Australia that will allow people to stay here permanently, that there is a permanent pathway to residency by arriving here illegally, that's of great concern. That's on the government because they have undermined Operation Sovereign Borders. All right, Jane Hume, we're out of time. Appreciate you coming in, though. Thank you so much.